All right, this uh, lecture is going to be over section 14.7. Uh, we're going to be discussing heat transfer. So the three mechanisms of heat transfer are conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is the transfer of the energy of molecular motion within materials without bulk motion of the materials. Convection involves the motion of a mass from one region to another. Radiation is going to be energy transfer through electromagnetic radiation. The heat current, H, uh, for conduction <clears throat> depends on the area, A, through which the heat flows, the length, L, of the heat path, and the temperature difference, as well as the thermal conductivity, K, of the material. So if you wrap all of that up into one equation, so you've got the heat current is equal to the thermal conductivity area and the temperature difference divided by the length of the heat path. The heat current H due to, radi due to radiation uh, is given by A E sigma T to the fourth, where A is gonna be the surface area, E is the emissivity of the surface, a pure number between zero and one, T is going to be the absolute Kelvin temperature, and sigma is going to be the Stefan Boltzmann constant. So this is for radiation. This is going to be for conduction. So remember the differences. Conduction is the transfer of the energy of molecular motion within materials without the motion of the material. Uh, convection is going to be the motion of a mass from one region to another, and radiation is the energy transfer through electromagnetic radiation. So let's take a look and see what the section says. All right. In the first section of this chapter, we spoke qualitatively about conductors and insulators, materials that permit or prevent heat transfer from objects. And we didn't give a lot of uh, study to the details. But if you're boiling water to make tea or trying to build an energy efficient house, you're gonna need to know how quickly or slowly heat is transferred. So in this section, we study the three mechanisms of heat transfer, uh, conduction, convection, and radiation. So for conduction, if you hold one end of a copper rod and place the other end in a flame, the end you are holding gets hotter and hotter, even though it isn't in direct contact with the flame. Heat reaches the cooler end by conduction through the material. So what's going on on the atomic level? The atoms in the hotter regions have more kinetic energy on average than their cooler neighbors, and they jostle their neighbors, giving them some of the energy, and then they jostle their neighbors, and so on and so forth, until eventually the end that you're holding is not something you may want to hold anymore. So the atoms themselves don't move from one region uh, of the material to the other, but the energy is transferred. Uh, in metals, uh, electron motion provides another mechanism for heat transfer. Most metals are good conductors of electricity because some electrons can leave their parent atoms and wander through the crystal lattice. These free electrons can carry energy from the hotter to the cooler regions of the material. Good thermal conductors such as silver, copper, aluminum, and gold are also good electrical conductors. Heat transfer occurs only between regions at different temperatures. Um, and the direction of heat flow is always from the higher temperature to the lower temperature. So we've got a rod here. <clears throat> it's got some cross-sectional area A and length L. The left end of the rod is kept at a temperature T sub H and the right end is kept at T sub C and the heat is flowing from here to here. Uh, we assume that the rod is insulated so that heat flows only from one end to the other and not out the sides or wherever else. Uh, in discussing the rate of heat transfer with time, uh, we'll change our notation slightly. So we're going to use delta Q rather than just Q uh, for the quantity of heat transferred in the time delta T. Then the rate of heat flow uh, with time is going to be delta Q over delta T. And we're going to call this rate the heat current and denote it by H. In other words, the change in heat divided by the change in time is just going to be the heat current, uh, just like 
uh, well, when you get into physics too, you'll see that the change in the charge or the change in time is going to be current there. You're going to be seeing the same thing here. Experiments show that the heat current is proportional to the cross-sectional area A. If we put the two identical uh, rods side by side, the total heat flow is twice as great as for each individual rod. It is also proportional to the temperature difference. And finally, it is inversely proportional to the length, L. I mean, the further away they are, the, the less that con, uh, conductivity is going to happen. So putting all of that together, you've got the heat current, which is delta Q over delta T, uh, is going to be equal to K, A, the temperature difference divided by L. And here are all of your units uh, to go along with that. Obviously, the value of K is going to depend on the material because that's going to influence how these uh, atoms or electrons start to uh, vibrate with energy. The quantity uh, of the difference in temperature divided by L is going to be the temperature difference per unit length, and it's going to be the temperature gradient. The numerical value of K depends on the metal of the material of the rod. Materials with large K and good conductors of heat, materials with small K are poor conductors and thus good insulators. So equation 1412 also gives the heat current through a slab or any homogeneous object with uniform cross-sectional area A perpendicular to the direction of the flow. L is the length of the heat flow path. Um, this table here is going to make it clear why copper and aluminum are often used in the bottoms of cooking pans. Both materials provide excellent thermal conductivity, thereby ensuring that the pan surface has a uniform temperature. In addition, both copper and aluminum are relatively cheap and easy to manufacture, so hey, hey, good for us. So you can see copper and aluminum there. Uh, you can also see other uh, elements here, uh, silver uh, one. Uh, the thermal conductivity of dead, non-moving air is very small. The wool sweater is warm because it traps air between the fibers. How, in fact, many insulating materials such as styrofoam or fiberglass are mostly dead air. Um, figure 14.18 shows a ceramic tile that's used in the space shuttle program. The tile has highly unusual thermal properties such as very small thermal conductivity and negligible specific heat. We've got several problems and tutorials here to work through. I would encourage you to do that. Now, convection is the transfer of heat by the motion of a mass of fluid from one region of space to another. Familiar examples include hot air and hot water home heating systems, uh, the cooling system of an automobile engine, and the heating and cooling of the body by the flow of blood. Uh, if the fluid is circulated by a blower or pump, the process is called forced convection. If the flow is caused by difference in densities due to thermal expansion, such as hot air rising, the process is called natural convection or free convection. Uh, convection in the atmosphere plays a dominant role in determining weather patterns, and convection in the oceans is an important global heat transfer mechanism. On a smaller scale, large predatory birds, such as vultures or eagles, will often use thermal updrafts to provide lift. This allows them to stay in flight for longer periods without flapping their wings, such as saving energy and wear and tear on the wings. Um, so you can see here, uh, during the day, the land is warmer uh, than the water. So you've got uh, convection drawing a sea breeze onto the shore. And at night, the land is cooler than the water, so convection sends a land breeze off the shore. Uh, the most important mechanism for heat transfer within the human body is forced convection of blood with the heart serving as the pump. Total rate of heat loss from the body is on the order of 100 to 200 watts. A dry, unclothed body in still air loses about 75 watts by radiation, but during vigorous exercise and plentiful perspiration, evaporative cooling with convection is the dominant mechanism. Uh, convective heat transfer is a complex process, and therefore there is no simple equation to describe it. Uh, read the rest of that there for yourself. Uh, heat transfer by radiation depends on electromagnetic waves such as visible light, infrared, and ultraviolet radiation. Everyone has felt the warmth of the sun's radiation and the intense heat from a charcoal grill. 
or from glowing coals in a fireplace. Heat from these very hot objects uh, reaches you not by convection or, con or conduction in the intervening air, but by radiation. This kind of heat transfer would occur even if there were nothing but vacuum between you and the source of heat. So every object, even at ordinary temperatures, emits energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. At ordinary temperatures, so you know, room temperature, nearly all the energy is carried by infrared waves, with wavelengths much longer than those of visible light. As the temperature rises, the wavelengths shift to shorter values. At 800 degrees Celsius, an object emits enough visible radiation to be self-luminous and appears red hot. Even uh, although at this temperature, most of the energy is carried by infrared waves. At 3000 degrees Celsius, the temperature of an incandescent lamp filament, uh, the radiation contains enough visible light that the object appears white hot. Uh, the rate of energy radiation from a surface is proportional to the surface area. The rate increases uh, very rapidly with temperature in proportion to the fourth power of the absolute temperature. The rate also depends on the nature of the surface, thus dependence is described as a quantity called emissivity. Um, it's some number between zero and one. Uh, the heat current due to the radiation uh, is going to be expressed as this, uh, where sigma is the fundamental physical constant called the Stefan-Boltzmann constant. Its relationship is called the Stefan-Boltzmann law in honor of its late 19th century discoverers. This is the experimentally found value. Emissivity is often larger for dark surfaces than for light ones. The emissivity of a smooth copper surface is about 0 0.3, but for a dull black surface, it's almost one. While an object at absolute Kelvin temperature is radiating, its, surf, its surroundings at temperature T sub S are also radiating and the object absorbs some of this radiation. If the object is in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings, the rate of radiation and absorption must be equal, otherwise you'd have a temperature difference. Uh, for this to be true, the rate of absorption must be given in general by the formula that we've just seen for heat current for radiation. Then the net rate of radiation uh, from an object at temperature with surrounding is given by this, basically the differences between the temperature of the object and the surrounding temperature. In the equation, the positive value means a heat flow out of the object. Um, and the equation here shows that for radiation, as for conduction and convection, the heat current depends on the temperature difference between the two objects. So an object that is a good absorber must also be a good emitter. An ideal radiator with an emissivity of unity is also an ideal absorber, absorbing all the radiation that strikes it. Such an ideal surface is called an ideal black body, or just simply a black body. Conversely, an ideal reflector, which absorbs no radiation at all, is a highly ineffective radiator. This is the reason the interior walls of a vacuum or thermos are coated with silver. A vacuum bottle has double glass walls, and the air is pumped out of the spaces between the walls eliminating nearly all heat transferred by conduction and convection. Silver coating on the walls reflects most of the radiation from the context back into the container and the wall itself is a very poor emitter. Thus a vacuum bottle can keep coffee or soup hot for several hours. The Dewar flask used to store very cold liquefied gases is exactly the same in principle. So, interesting reading there and please work some of those problems.